farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell on along the path. And the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants, so that they did not bear, they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew, and produced a crop, multiplying 30, 60, or even 100 times. Then Jesus said, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. When he was alone, the twelve and the others around him asked him about the parables. He told them, The secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to those on the outside, everything is said in parables, so that they may be ever seeing, but never perceiving, and ever hearing, but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. Then Jesus said to them, Don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? The farmer sows the word. Some people are like seed along the the path where the word is sown. And as soon as they hear Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Others, like seed sown on rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others, like seed sown among thorns, Hear the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires of other things come in and choke the word, <clears throat> making it unfruitful. Others, like seeds sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop. Thirty, sixty, or even a hundred times what was sown. Now, also, our second passage is also found in chapter 4. Drop down to verses 26 through 29. And this is entitled, The Parable of the Growing Seed. He also said, this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground. Night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain, first the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it because the harvest has come. And that's our scripture reading, and at this time, this is the time the children can be dismissed for children's church. So you might think this passage sounds familiar, especially if you were here last week. Because the sermon title, sorry, this morning I seem to be stumbling on my words, was entitled, Well, well, this is the same passage, but this is from Mark. It's not from Matthew. And well, we have a lot more to talk about. So we'll get started here after prayer. Father, we thank you so much for all that you have done for us. We thank you for planting the seed of your word among us. We thank you that it has stood the test of time, that we know that it will always be truth, that we can stand according to your word and your promises that we find in them. And Father, help us review your word today to see what your glorious plan is for us, that you want us to be a part of that process. And we just thank you so much for the opportunity to come here and freely worship you. We thank you and praise you for us in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. So last week we talked about the parable of the sower from Matthew. And I explained the different types of soil and concentrated most on being good soil. If you're not good soil, you're not going to be productive. You're not going to produce a crop. And I challenge you to be like Barnabas and we're going to challenge you again to do that. And I ask you, what were you going to do with the seed that God gave you? Well, this week's sermon is about seed germination, which is a process whereby seeds sprout and begin to grow. A seed is basically a copy of the plant that it came from. Genetically, it has all the information needed to grow into a complete plant. It's all found in that seed. It contains an embryo, a food storage, and then an outer casing to protect it. In order for a seed to grow, though, however, it must be planted in soil. And if it's going to grow effectively and produce fruit, be the plant that it was supposed to be, it has to be planted into good soil. Then there's germination. Out of something that seems to be dead, we have life spring up, and it springs up rapidly and abundantly. Life is just waiting to be burst out of the seed. And hopefully the plant will grow and mature into a full plant with its purpose of making more seed to make more plants of its same kind. 
But a plant has to reach maturity if that's going to happen. The amount of seed that plants have varies. If it's an avocado, they have one big seed. But yet an avocado tree may produce a hundred avocados in a season. If it's a watermelon, a watermelon may have hundreds of seeds. But still the vine produces maybe a dozen watermelons during the season. So an effective plant will be able to reproduce itself and it will be able to feed, to, to nourish. The purpose of seeds are to create new life identical to the plant itself. This new life will not happen unless the seeds are dispersed and find their way back to the soil. Some of you look kind of confused. You're wondering why I'm talking about all this. So I've got a little video that might help explain it a little bit better. Faith that the seed is going to sprout and become what you planted. If you plant beans, you have faith that they will come up and that they will produce a crop of beans. That's what you're looking for. And then you can plant more seed as a result of that. So last week we looked at the parable of the sower from Matthew. This week I want to look at Mark. Remember though, the ultimate, ultimately the seed's sole purpose is to reproduce its own kind. In the parable of the sower, the seed had been sown into different types of soils, which yielded varying results of failure and success, both. We looked at those different types. The seed, each seed that was planted, which we found out that the seed was the Word of God, The seed had all of the potential. The difference is whether the soil was acceptable to that seed or not. Whether the soil was good enough for the seed to come up and be be productive or not. Christians are called to be the first fruits. Once you've heard that seed and you accept Jesus Christ through the reading of the Word and understanding, and you accept Him to be your Savior, to keep you from condemnation of your sins, to bring you to an inheritance of God rather than condemnation, then you're called to be part of that process. You're called to become a plant that grows to maturity so that it will develop seed so that other people will come to know Jesus Christ. James 1.18 says this, He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, which is His seed, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all that He created. That's what we're called to do. We're not called to become saved and just sit there and do it. We're not called to study God's Word to bring ourselves to perfection or righteousness. We're called to be His hands and feet, to be the salt of the earth. So let's look at the parable of the sower from Mark. Starting in verse 1, it says, Again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd that gathered around Him was so large that He got into a boat and sat in it on the lake. While all the people were along the shore... At the water's edge. He taught them many things by parables. And in his teaching he said, Listen. Do you do that when you're talking to your child or someone else? Well, you know they're really not paying you attention. You say, Listen, this is important. He says, Listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. And the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched. They were withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked out the plants, and they did not bear grain. Other seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew, and produced a crop, multiplying thirty, sixty, or even a hundred times. Then Jesus said, He who has ears, let him hear. When he was alone, the twelve and the twelve and others around him, ask him about the parables. He told them, The secrets of the kingdom of God have been given to you. But to those on the outside, everything is said in parables, so that they may be ever seeing but never perceiving, and ever hearing but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. Then Jesus said to them, Don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? The farmer sows the word. Some people are like seed along the path. When the word is sown, as soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown with them. Others like seed sown on rocky places, where the where the word hear the word and once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others are like seed among thorns. They hear the word 
But the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Others, like seed sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop. Thirty, sixty, or even a hundred times what was sown. And Luke said that by persevering, they produce a crop. I think it's important to read the different accounts. We've got four different gospel accounts so that we can get four different authors, interpretations, viewpoints, perspectives of the story. Three times we read about this account. John doesn't have an account of it. There's so much information to learn here. Last time we talked about the different types of soils, and I focused on that either you were the path, which the path was no soil at all, A path is a hard place where the seed cannot impact the ground. Many of the seeds are trampled on or the birds came and ate it up. And Jesus compares that to those that hear the word, but their heart is not ready at all and they reject the word. There is no salvation. There is no seed springing forth. There is no seed germination. There is no life, only death. Then we looked at the other types of soils. We concentrated most on the good soil because the good soil was the only one that produced a healthy crop. Well, this week I want to focus a little bit more on the other soils as well. If you look back in verse 4, excuse me, verse 5, it says, Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly, but the soil was shallow. When the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Most of the time, you don't see the rocks under the surface. But with the rock under the surface, you do have soil. There is soil there, so the seed will germinate. But when it germinates, the root can't get deep. It's stopped by a hard surface again, just like the path. Your heart is still calloused and hard. That root can't get any further than that. So you spring up and you have every likeness of a plant that's going to be healthy. Again, the power was in the seed. The seed sprung up once it was planted in soil. So there was definitely soil there, but there was a rock under the surface that prevented it from having a good root structure. And if you have farmed much, you know that if you don't have a good deep root, the plant is not going to grow. Take a plant, put it in a very small pot, it's not going to grow big. Take that same plant, put it in a bigger pot, it's going to grow bigger. It has to have the root to be able to grow. It may have buds, it may have leaves, it may look everything like the plant that it's supposed to look like. But if it has no root structure, it will not last. When heat comes upon it, the sun, that hot day comes, it will burn that plant up. So when the worries of this life come, the trials of this life come, and you're persecuted for being a Christian... And we don't even know what persecution is for being a Christian. But when that comes and somebody mocks you in Jesus' name, you're going to say, I don't want any part of this. My faith is not that deep. I don't have the root structure. So you're going to wither. And it says the plant withered because it has no root. What happens when a plant withers? It dies. It can't get the nutrition that it needs. And it dies prematurely before it gets its purpose out which its purpose was to produce seeds so that it could reproduce its own kind. So without that happening, the plant dies and there is no reproduction. There are no more plants. If that was the last watermelon plant on this earth, there will be no more, and last seed of it, there will be no more watermelon plants because that plant failed to produce because it did not have enough soil. There were rocks in it. Well, the next type of soil was a seed, other seed fell among the thorns in verse 7 which grew up and choked the plant so that they did not bear grain. If you garden it all, you realize you've got to get the weeds up. So what you do is you prepare the soil first. You spray pesticides and stuff to get the soil ready. You you cultivate it so that air can get in the soil and everything. But you know if you farm, that's not the last thing that you do. Weed picking is a constant battle. No matter what you do, you're still going to have weeds come up. And what happens when you have too many weeds? They choke the plant. Those same weeds are are fighting for all the nutrients and everything in the soil. You're battling over things that are from God and things that the world tells you are important. 
You're not willing to go and pursue God fully because you've got this career you need to pursue. Or you've got these dreams that you want to have. Or these payments that you're tied into. So you let those become your God rather than the one true God. You're choked out. And what does Jesus say here? They did not bear grain. If they did not bear grain, there will be no further growth. It stops there. Once that plant dies, it's done with. There are no more watermelons again. No more apples, whatever that seed was. Still, the other seeds fell on good soil. They grew up and produced a crop. And the crop varied, multiplying 30, 60, or even 100 times. It's not easy to plant a garden, but all the power is in the seed. The work is kind of hard. You've got to get rid of those rocks. You've got to get rid of those thorns. You've got to continually pick them out if you're going to have a good, effective crop. Sherry didn't plant a garden this year, and I was so thankful because she's got to have every single weed out of that garden. And, and I don't see the point in that. But from Scripture, it's kind of given me a new light on it. I see why she's out there all the time. Because she'd be up there from sun up to sundown, picking up every single weed and have me coming out there. Is, do you see one anywhere? <laughs> but the problem also, when you've got little tender plants, she's decent at it. I can't tell you the difference. They all look like weeds to me. I can't tell you which one is the plant. And that's the truth so many times with Christians. Because when they're sprouting and starting to grow... They still are trapped by the cares of this world. The thorns are all around them. The weeds are all around them. And you don't see what's really the Christian or not because he's not significantly different. So you've got to get those weeds and everything out of there so that that plant will fully mature. The Word of God is a powerful seed. It contains everything necessary for life. And it does all the work. You may have to weed a little bit and stuff, but it produces the life. The power is in the seed to produce life, not death. The purpose of the seed, God's Word, is to bring about life that produces a crop of seed, which in turn produces more of its own kind. So if this is the seed and it produces Christians, when we plant more of these seeds, we'll have more Christians, more people that are like Christ, because it can't produce anything else. Seed produce their own kind. No farmer or scientist can clearly understand or explain how a dead, dormant seed can produce life. But you bury it in the soil and it happens, whether you understand it or not. And so many times we focus on that and think we need to understand it. You don't need to understand it, you just need to accept it. The power is still in the seed. No matter whether you understand it or not, the seed, if it's planted in soil, will germinate. Here's what happens. You plant a seed in soil, whether it's good soil or not, And in less than 24, well, first, the outer hull breaks down and it starts to soak up moisture that's in the soil. Even if you don't think there's much moisture in there, there's some moisture in there, it gets it. And the outer husk starts to swell because that plant inside is getting the moisture and it's starting to produce. Soon the chemical makeup of the seed begins to change. And in many cases, in less than 24 hours, the seed shoots roots downward to sustain life and shoots a sprout upwards, showing the sign of life. Because we don't see that sign until it breaks the surface and starts growing. The root has the power, has the strength. That's where it's pulling the life from, from the nutrients in the soil. So if your heart isn't what it should be, what is it pulling from? What are your roots grounded in? Deceit and lies? Things of this world? Are they grounded in godliness? When you plant that seed, the chemical reaction starts. Do you know archaeologists found seeds in some of the tombs? They put seeds in the tombs so that they could feed their pharaohs, kings, once they got to their afterlife. They needed food. Well, I'm not worried about that. God's going to provide for me. But they had seed in the tombs and they found them. And because they were in a dark environment and away from soil, those seeds, nothing had happened to them. And I think it's really neat because they were in that tomb with total darkness. What happens when they plant it in soil and there's light? There's light from God? Because all good things come from God. Those seeds sprouted. 3,000, 5,000 year old, however old they were, seeds sprouted once they were put in soil. 
no signs of life, whatever, we would think that there was no life in there. Those seeds were thousands of years old. But once planted in soil, they sprung to life because the power is in the seed. Faith is the complete trust or confidence in someone or something. And Hebrews 11.1 1 defines it this way. It says, Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. You don't have to understand it. You have to have faith. You'll never understand it. You might prick the surface and understand some things better as you pursue God's Word more and more. You should as you dive into it. But you'll never fully understand it. The power is in this seed. This is God's plan. You're part of that plan. Faith comes from hearing the Word of God, which is the seed. But without soil, you don't have faith. The seed that fell along the path had no soil. Everything that you need to produce life is in the seed. But you have to have the soil to accept it. If you do not accept that seed, if that seed sits on the shelf and never gets looked at, never gets told about to anyone else, it's just going to be sitting there in the pack on the shelf. Its powers are going to remain dormant. Unless a seed is planted, you will not see Growth, you will not see life. Romans 10, verses 13 through 17 say, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the name, call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? If we don't tell others about Jesus Christ, how can they hear? Or how can they believe and have faith if they don't hear? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? Verse 15, And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. But not all the Israelites accept the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our messenger? Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, the seed, the word of God. And this message is heard through the word of Christ. Paul says that faith comes from hearing the seed. And if you believe or have faith and call upon the name of the Lord, then what? You will be saved. Period. That's what it says. You don't have to reach God. You can't reach God. And I've said it before, Christianity is the only religion where God comes to you, sees your failures, sees who you are. You're not perfect. There's no way you can ever achieve Him. Other religions, you do your best by works and motives to try to reach nirvana or whatever that they call it. But God knows that you can't, so He comes to you. No one is righteous, no, not one. And for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. You can't have that faith, you can't believe unless you hear the Word of God, though. You can't hear the Word of God if the plant never reaches maturity and never develops seed and broadcasts those seeds. There's a verse that you all know well. It's John 3.16. What does it say? But it doesn't stop there, does it? That's not the only verse. Yes, God loved the world so much that Jesus came, suffered, and died for them. That's how much God loved you. No way am I going to let my son die for you. Sorry, I love you all, but it ain't happening. (laughs) But God sent His Son to die for you, every one of you, no matter what you've done, no matter what you will do. But it doesn't stop there. Let's read on in verses 17 through 19. For God did not send His Son in the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. Whosoever believes in Him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already. You're condemned because you are a sinner. But if you believe in Jesus Christ, you're not. He didn't come to condemn the world. Because He has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world. But men love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Faith in Jesus Christ brings salvation rather than condemnation. Galatians 3, verse 22 and 26 say this, But the Scripture declares the whole world is a prisoner of sin. 
so that what was promised, being given through faith in Jesus Christ, might be given to those who believe. In verse 26, you are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. That's what faith does. Faith restores your relationship with God. In the beginning, He created us because He wanted a relationship with us. He didn't need it. He wanted it. He loved you, but we turned our back on Him. And then He still loved us despite who He was. That is so unfathomable. Righteous, holy God that created this insect, and they turned their back on Him and spit in His face. And yet He still loved them and said, Here's my plan. I'm going to send my Son to die for you. And if you simply accept Him, if you believe, once you hear the Word, the seed, and repent, you will be saved. You will be restored. But then He calls us to grow to maturity so that we can spread those seeds. So what about the rocky soil and the thorny soil? What do you think about them? I didn't mention them much last week. Because so many times we focus on the wrong thing. We focus on, well, those soils both accepted Jesus Christ. They heard There was growth. But what good were those soils, whether they did or didn't? Maybe they had fire insurance. Maybe they got into heaven by the skin of their teeth. But what a worthless life that they lived. They never reached potential. They never reached maturity. They never developed fruit. They never developed seed. They never cast that seed and got to see the results of that, which was what they were designed for. A seed is designed to produce life. And then it's designed to grow to maturity so that it produces more of its own kind. So in the case of the rocky soil, that didn't happen. In the case of the thorny soil, that did not happen. And we can all relate to this. I've been a thorny soil most of all of my life and I'm still picking out thorns. I'm not afraid to say it. We're a work in process. But if we don't work to have that good soil to produce fruit, to produce the seed that will offspring into other Christians... What good is it? Have we lived a life of worth or a worthless life? So what about the seed that fell on the rocky soil? The soil lacked root. And then it withered because of that. It lacked faith. There was faith there. There was soil there because it sprouted. And it had every power that it needed. It got the same seed. If it was a bean again, it was the same seed that you planted in the good soil that produced. But because of the rocks, it lacked faith. It had no depth. And that made the plant wither and die. It never produced the fruit that it was designed to produce. What's left when when the plant died? Rocky soil. Worthless soil. That was all that's left out of its life. It was worthless, rocky soil. Maybe there was salvation. I don't know. I'm not God. He knows man's heart. I don't. Well, what about the thorny soil? The soil has to be completely rid of all traces of weeds and thorns. Or if you don't realize it, all of a sudden you've got weeds that look just like the plant. Some weeds mock the plant for that reason. They choke the life out of it. And if they mock the plant and imitate it, if you think your trust is in it rather than in God, then you put your emphasis in that. Well, maybe you don't put your emphasis in drugs or alcohol or, or whatever your sins are. Maybe you put that emphasis in your family. That's a good thing, right? And they become your God. Not when they become your God. Even the best motives, the ones that look just like the real plant, are still things in disguise. Yes, God wants you to have a family. He wants you to have good things. He created this world so that you could enjoy. And when He was done with it, He said it was perfect. He wants you to have good things, just like your earthly father should want you to have. But He wants to be God. He deserves to be God, and He will be God, whether you accept it or not, whether you get the thorns out of your life. But if you don't get the thorns out of your life, they will choke you. You never will reach maturity. You will not develop the fruit that you were intended and designed. You rob the seed of its power. The seed had all of the power to produce that healthy plant. And you rob God and yourself of the blessings of telling others about Jesus Christ. Your faith 
is simply in the wrong things. And that's what Satan is. He's a deceiver. He came to Eve and said, is that what God really said? He doesn't come out and just tell you to disobey God. He says, put your trust in this. And He can't tempt you with the things that you know are wrong. He's going to tempt you with the things that you think are right. He's still going to take your attention. Jesus said, you can't serve two masters. I've always ran my own business, whether it was my parents or Sherry's parents, and I was a workaholic. Yeah, I still went to church. Yeah, I went witnessing. I tithed. But if I didn't devote my time so much to that work, look at the time that I could have spent devoting it to God's work. What difference could that fruit have been, those seeds that I could have planted? Yes, we have to work. And that's what I always struggled with. The Bible says if you don't work, you don't eat. But I didn't have to work 60 hours a week to make this much money to live this kind of lifestyle. I never thought it was my God, but looking back and understanding this Word as a whole, it robbed me. It robbed me of the growth and the fruit that I could have had. I run my own business now, but you don't see me there most of the time because I don't care about it. (laughs) I've put it in God's hands. I have faith in Him. He will supply it or He won't supply it. No matter how hard I work, no matter how much effort I have, it may be gone tomorrow. Most of the sales we sell are on the Internet. The Internet may crash. I don't know. I can't control anything. But God will provide. doesn't mean I don't work. I work. But I don't care about it as much anymore. It's not my God. He's my God. He's who I want to serve. Wholeheartedly. So we chase after things rather than God. We chase after the creation rather than the Creator. We're afraid to give them up because we lack the faith in God. Well, if we won't give them up to Him, that's saying we have more faith in the things, the Creator. I have more faith that I can take care of myself and provide for my family the way I should, the way I deserve. I don't have enough faith to give it all to God and see where He takes me. And we're all guilty of that. Faith in the wrong thing produces thorns and weeds. And they rob us of growing to our potential. And what happens? We don't bear fruit or grain. What is wheat? Most of these parables are more about wheat. It doesn't say here for sure. But wheat is a staple food for the world. It's what the world lives off of. Without wheat, people would starve. Without this word, people will starve spiritually. And what happens when they die? There's no do-overs. They're condemned. The verse that we read said we're condemned already. But that faith comes from hearing. And who's going to hear unless people tell about it? The seed's the same. Even though there was life in these two cases, it was choked out and died, producing no fruit, no seed to feed the world. Yet God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. That means we made that worthless, didn't we? at least in our own opinion, because we weren't willing to give it all to God, to have faith in Him. So what Jesus Christ did on the cross was meaningless. We've got to cultivate our lives. We've got to get the rocks out of our soul. We've got to get the thorns out and produce what we were designed to do. A seed is designed to produce its own kind. Without that happening, the seed is worthless. So I asked a question last week, what type of soil were you? If you remember from the parable in verse 3, Jesus said, listen. Then in verse 13, He went on to say this, Do you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? And He clearly told them. You have the answer there. You don't have to figure out this parable and say, I don't understand. It's here. Faith comes from hearing the Word of God. But if you lack faith, then you won't have growth. You won't have maturity. You won't have seeds to develop. We all seem to recognize the path is a lack of faith. But we fail to see that the rocky soil and the thorny soil is misguided faith. What good is faith if it's not wholehearted faith? Faith. Remember that wise old fool Solomon we talked about before? Well, he said this in 1 Kings 8.39. This was his prayer 
when he took over. He said, Then hear from heaven your dwelling place. He recognized who God was. Forgive and act. Deal with each man according to all that he does, since you know his heart. For you alone know the hearts of all men. Well, I can see the hearts of the men that were stony soil, and I can see the hearts of the men that were thorny soil. I can't see that in reality, but I can see it in this parable, and we can apply our lives to that. Their heart was not focused on God, and God knows your heart. Romans 2, 5, and 6 says this, But because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath. That's what you will receive instead of grace. Against yourself for the day of God's wrath, when His righteous judgment will be revealed. God will give to each person according to what He's done. So if you've lived a life that has not produced fruit, that has withered and died, you figure out the rest. What did the rocky and thorny soil do? They did not pursue God wholeheartedly. Jesus was clear when He gave us this parable. He explained it to us so that it would be clear. And Mark had more to say about it. We read that earlier today, and it's called the parable of the growing seed. It's found in Mark 4, verses 26 through 29. He also said, and then Mark is the only one that records this. That's why I went with that passage today. This is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground. Night and day, whether he sleeps or gets, gets up, the seed sprouts and grows. Though he does not know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain. First the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts a sickle to it because the harvest has come. The kingdom of God is the way that the gospel is spread. might not be my plan or your plan, but it's God's plan. There is no other plan. That's how He's designed it. You are to partake in it by becoming a good, healthy plant. You don't need the power. The power is in the seed. You just have to accept it. You have to cultivate and everything to make that right where you can accept and apply all of God's Word. He has the power. He has the ability to save. So many times we say, I'm not ready, God. It doesn't matter about whether you're ready or not. The power's in the seed. I'm not ready to do this. I've not been trained up enough. I don't know what to say. He'll give it to you. He gave us His Spirit. Jesus said, I have to go so that the Father can give you what He promised. And He said, wait till you get that. And then you will be My witnesses in Jerusalem, in Samaria, in Judea, and to the utter ends of the earth. That's His plan. If you're not being part of it, you're not going to be blessed. You might have salvation. I'm not going to argue that today or not. But you won't be blessed like you should be blessed. You won't see those fruits. You won't have offspring. The power is in the seed. We look at it as it's a chore so many times as Christians. When it's a glorious privilege that He has given us to share the gospel message. And how will you know those blessings unless you do it? I don't know about you, but when I get to heaven, I want that statement, well done, my good and faithful servant. I don't want you didn't do what you're supposed to do. And there are other verses that says, many came to Jesus and said, Lord, Lord. And He said, depart me from me. I do not know you. I certainly don't want to be that person. We're called to be the seed to be the sowers of the seed. And when the seed is planted, we let God do the work because that's where the power's at. That's the design of a plant. That's the design of the Christian. To be a mature plant that produces seed so that there will be offspring like the plant, like Christ. So are you do, what are you doing with the seed that God has given you? If the soil is bad, if there's rocks in it, there's thorns in it, guess what? There's still time. That verse said, in Mark, it said, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, because that's where the power is. Though he does not know how, all by itself the soil produces grain. And there's growth here. Don't feel bad, we're all sinners saved by grace. First the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. It's growth. Don't feel bad if you're struggling. Struggle. Get weeds out. Give it to God. The power is here. Don't sit there and say, I can't do it. 
Say, God, you can do it. John 4.36 says this, and I did the New Living Translation. The harvesters are paid good wages, and the fruit they harvest is people brought to eternal life. What joy awaits both the planter and the harvester alike. Do you want to be part of that joy? Remember this. These are bean seeds. If they're left in the packet, they don't do anything, do they? Someone's got to get out there and plant those seeds. All the power is in the seeds. But if we don't plant it, we will never see the joy that God has planned for us. Let's bow our heads. Father, thank You so much for Your Word. We thank You for the life that Jesus Christ gave us so that we could see how to live. We thank You for His obedience unto death, Father. He knew Your plan. He knew Your motives. And He loved us passionately just as You do. And He died so that we could live a life abundantly. Father, help us to be obedient. Help us to cultivate our soil so that we can have strong roots, that we can grow strong plants that develop fruit and that we can rely on You because all the power is in You. You've given us everything that we need. But we have to be obedient, Father. And I just pray for that obedience today. I pray that Your Spirit is upon this place. And it's not my words, Father, but Your words that prick and and convict, Father. That we may make a difference in this world. There are so many starving people out there that need your food. And if they don't have it, they'll die. Help us to be your hands and feet. To bring light to a world that's in darkness. So that we may bring glory and honor to you. And when the time comes for the harvest, we'll be mature plants. Ready for the harvest. And we'll take part in all the joy that you have to give us. We thank you so much. For it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.